since this book club is all about like introducing people to authors in Central Pennsylvania, my first question is just going to be like, can you tell us a little bit about your ties to Central Pennsylvania? If you grew up here, if you moved here, whatever. Yeah, I, I grew up in Gettysburg. Um, I moved to Alaska for two years in the mid '90s and studied writing. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up in Gettysburg, just a few miles outside. I went to all the Gettysburg schools, high school, graduated Gettysburg High School in '81, and the book syncs up perfectly with me because mm -hmm. um, it's kind of supposed to read like a little bit like a memoir. And I was actually wondering about that. It seems like autobiographical. Obviously, you share a name with the main character. You grew up in the same area, so you can just talk a little bit about that. Like, is it autobiographical? Is this about you? Yeah, I, well, I wrote it to um, read like a memoir because mm -hmm. I thought it had to for the book. Um, it served the book. And um, yeah, I do use my own name. That was a little bit. I went back and forth on that because it's my name, but you know I got a wife and children too, mm -hmm. so um, but they were cool with it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's it's anytime you write, you know, that's a part that's yourself in there. So there are elements in it that um, are autobiographical, um, like the 1969 flashback um, to first grade um, and the way we were, you know, kind of treated back then. Um, 1969, I've told this story for years to my family, um, in August of 69, man landed on the moon, which doesn't seem like a big, huge thing right now, because, you know, somebody, you know, like yourself, it's always been there, but when it happened, it was like the pinnacle of human achievement. I mean, we actually sent a man to the moon, and he was walking around up there, and you could go outside, and, you know, in the morning, look up at the moon, and there was somebody up there, and it was cool. And when I started school, just a few weeks later, um, we were kind of, the boys were kind of like um, held to the standard of the Apollo astronauts almost. Mm -hmm. um, like in, this, in the flashback in the story, um, you know, we were held to like, you know, if you, back then there was no such thing as preschool and, you know, very few kids went to um, kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So you basically started first grade with what your parents had taught you, and if you were like a little shaky on the alphabet or whatever, it was like, you can send a man to the moon, but you know, you, you don't know the alphabet, or you know, God forbid you made a letter backwards or something. Mm -hmm. So it was a little, a little brutal back then, and that is my remembrance of it. Yeah. Interesting. And so going off of that, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to, but that story is real. Is the last scone story real? No, because uh, my dad was um, in food service, but my, my wife and I um, made our living for years as a farmer's market vendor selling our baked goods. Mm -hmm. So that's where I drew a lot of that stuff. But no, that story is not, tr not mm -hmm. true. There's a couple stories in there that kind of have elements of truth in it, mm -hmm. but overall it's not. You know, I wrote it like a memoir, and um, I think it kind of worked because I had people who knew me my entire life read the book, and they'd be like, um, I don't remember any of this happening. <laughs> <laughs> you succeeded then. Yeah, they were yeah, convinced. it worked. Like, maybe, it worked. maybe it did happen. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, and maybe this just goes back to like you were saying about growing up here, but why did you choose to make the setting like Gettysburg, Pennsylvania? Well, because I grew up here, and um, for years I was part of the Gettysburg Farmer's Market on the square, which is um, kind of uh, where that takes place. It's not the, the same farmer's market because one didn't exist back then. But I, I know the area, and nobody has ever really written. There's tons of books about Gettysburg, you know, but they're all Civil War books. So I really truly think that this is the only published novel set in Gettysburg that's not, you know, Civil War centric. I will say that did grab our attention. I forget. I think you might have said that you reached out to Allie or something. And yeah, it's like it's not yeah. a Civil War book, and you're like, oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's a great location, and it's the most famous little town in America. But nobody's ever thought to set a book there that's not, you know, something to do with the Civil War. Yeah, fly under the radar a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we actually we were wondering if we were passing the battlefields on the way here. We were, like, trying to look at the map. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, so, obviously, like, a lot of this novel comes from just you and your experience and everything like that. Was there any, like, research that you had to do to put into it? Well, the, research, the only research I did was the first um, two chapters deal with Fat Camp. And there's really... I googled Fat Camp, you know, they did exist, and they were called that, they were called Fat Camp, and there's almost no um, 
information that you can get anywhere on, that, on uh, Google from it. Um, most of them were up in New York. And really the only thing I got that I could use in the book and was the, the diet that the kids were fed. Um, if you read those chapters, I mean, they're given rice for all three meals, which is the exact wrong thing to do if you're trying to lose weight, because that's just all, you know, simple carbs. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the one thing I actually did research on. Mm -hmm. the, the, that and the single slice of peach. I read that yeah. and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, I can't imagine that being my yeah, meal. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's so horrible because these kids were set up to, you know, it's kind of a shameful thing in our past, mm -hmm. um, but they were kind of set up to, to lose. You know, the research I did do said basically it's the same kids back every year because they just, you know, exercised them and fed them peaches and rice and, you know, a small amount of protein, and they would lose weight. But, you know, as soon as you got back home, you're going to gain it back, you know. Yeah. Uh, like but um, mostly now it's, it's, it's genre stuff because um, people always come up, well, what genre is this? And so it's a, I tell them it's a romantic comedy because i got to say something. But it's not really a romantic comedy because... Yeah, it's funny in that there's romance in it, but you know, but it's um, not what people expect from a romantic comedy usually, because yeah. um, they're always written from a woman's point of view, yeah. and they always have the happily ever after, and they got all these different things that you got to hit on certain pages, like yeah. page three, it's got to have this, page five, it's got to have this. They're kind of formulatic, but um, I wish I could write like that, but it's just not what interests me about writing. Yeah. You know, I just like getting the idea, and I like um, putting things together. It sounds more fun that way, almost. so it gives you a little bit more freedom. Yeah, because I mean, cause you, you're never going to get rich. Um, like, I had a publishing contract for that, but I tell people, it's not life-changing money. It's not even week-changing money. So it's easiest to write where you just make yourself the main character, because then you know you got at least one consistent character in the book. Um, so that's, that's me, not the events, but it's my sense of humor, and it's, um, you know, that's you know, pretty much how, how I am. So if you read the book, you would know me, you would feel you knew me personally almost. And um, I always like to have a best friend in the book, because a lot of books are about romance, you know, that's fine, that's good, and this book is too, but people miss out on the best friend thing. So um, his best friend, I needed a character to come in at the beginning and um, be kind of a little bit weird, you know. So he came in, and his name's Wayne in the book, which was my, my brother's name. And um, he, he was only supposed to be in the book the first couple chapters, but like oftentimes when you're writing a book, you, you create a character, and they just keep muscling their way back into the book. Because either they're so much fun to, to write, or they got something the book needs, or the book takes a different turn, and then you need that character. Um, so anyway, Wayne was supposed to drop out, but um, he muscled his way back in. You know, so he's there, there to the end. Yeah, I was just uh, got through the his date with Angela, and I think we hadn't seen Wayne for a little bit, and I was like, oh, like Wayne's still here, hey Wayne. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had to go, kind of go back in and backfill a yeah. little bit because I kept him in to the end. But yeah. same thing happened with my first book. Um, I just brought one character in because I needed somebody to tell a story, and then he was such a such a so much fun to write that he just he forced his way into the book. Yeah. That's so fun when they like sort of like get a, their own little life like that. Yeah, yeah, it's um, they they almost become like real people to you. Mm -hmm. And when you're done writing, because you spent I spent three years on each book, you kind of miss them. Yeah, they don't exist, but you miss them anyway. Yeah. you know. And then the third character is um, Bree. Um, she's in it the whole way through. Um, where you're at, she's kind of dropped out, but she'll be back. Um, and she's, I'm, I'm not giving anything away. She's the character that you're rooting, because everybody who reads the book tells me they're totally rooting for um, Jim and Bree to get together. Mm -hmm. You know, So it's, it's foreshadowed the whole way through, so it's, it's not giving away the ending. Yeah. That's awesome. And our... You mentioned that you have a brother. Is Wayne reminiscent of your brother? Is Trez reminiscent of your brother? Uh, no, probably the most reminiscent person in, in the book is the father character is like a composite of my dad, where everything is overblown. Um, 
And he did look like William Shatner when he was young. I mean, you might not know who William Shatner is, but mm -hmm. Captain Kirk, you know, oh, Star okay. Trek, right? Yeah. So he does look, you know, remarkably like him in these younger pictures. But that's the character, and I put a little bit of myself in there because I'm a dad. Mm -hmm. So um, I just like the idea of this father. And it does kind of, what I drew from farmer's markets is that when you're a vendor in a farmer's market, it's like seven really intense months and your life is just in orbit around it, and you kind of lose perspective. So the father character has definitely lost perspective. You know, he's, um, you know, over the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, like when they were packing everything up and shutting down the bakery, I like felt that emotion. Like, yeah. Oh, like, this guy really doesn't know what to do. Like, yeah. I can't blame him. Yeah, and then he uh, has his tent, which was, you know, back in even the early 90s, farmer's markets, a lot of vendors didn't have tents because you didn't get these cheap pop-up tents. They were something you had to assemble, which you couldn't do, mm -hmm. you know, an hour before market. So it was painful to him when he had to basically trade the mm -hmm. um, tent that set him apart for, you know, a wheelchair. Yeah. yeah. Symbol of his whole business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's painful. You can, if you're in business and things don't go well or whatever, your entire body is and soul and heart's tied up in it. Yeah. Kind of like being an author, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, can you actually talk a little bit about like your journey becoming an author? Was it something that you always wanted to do, or did it just sort of happen? Or well, <clears throat> I read Catch Twenty Two when I was sixteen at summer camp, and um, from that moment on, I'd always had it in my head I wanted to write a book, and I really didn't do anything with it. And when I started, I went back to college when I was twenty-six. I went to Hack. And because they had great, they had just started the Gettysburg branch of it where they had little classes scattered all over Gettysburg. I mean, you might meet at a library like this for one class and then you go somewhere to, you know, James Gettys Elementary or something for another class. And um, right around that time, I tried to write a couple short stories. And I wrote two. And it's like, you know, these, that's, this is kind of fun. And I actually can do this and write them and make them funny and everything. So I went to college in Alaska. And I took some really good creative writing classes up there. We had some really talented professors. And um, I just wrote short stories for a long time. And then when I wanted to write my first novel, I thought I'd give it a try. I thought, well, why can't you write a novel length short story? Right? It's just something as tight as a short story. And I started to write it. And um, I kind of realized why nobody does that, because it doesn't work. Um, the things that make a novel kind of work or the air in it. You know, you got to have, because nobody wants to read something really intense for 300 pages or 10 or 12 hours, whatever. So you need air in it. You need to let the reader's mind kind of like drift a little bit maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between short stories and novels. And now that I've written two novels, I really, I've tried to write short stories again, but my mind doesn't work like that anymore. So I've kind of lost that ability at this mm -hmm. point. That was something that like what I've read so far with Farmer's Market Romeo, I thought it was cool. Like, like you get this little tidbit in this one section, and then like I, just when I'm starting to think, like, oh, I wonder like what the point of that was. It like comes back. I'm like, wait, okay, so I heard that story, so that they can talk about it later. Like, I don't know. It's just sort of that. Like, it almost seemed like connected short stories. I guess. Yeah. Well, I wrote it. Um, my initial idea was to write it like a Netflix limited run series. So as you notice, each chapter takes about 45 minutes to read. Mm -hmm. It's got a beginning, middle, and an end. And it almost stands alone on itself. So I would argue that you could read any of the eight chapters in any order and still kind of get the same story. Um, there is overlap. And um, like you said, they connect together in a broader sense because it tells the overall arc from when he's 12 to when he's 24. And it checks back on him and each kind of times when his life tilts. Because as a writer, that's the interesting thing when somebody's life tilts and now all of a sudden they got to figure out who they are again like in the first chapter when he comes out of his latency period and has the crush on Doris he's in uncharted territory he's got to figure out who am I now I'm not the person I was for the first 12 years of my life mm -hmm. and then um, as he goes on you know different things happen and he's had a different section in his life and you know each time he's got to figure out again who am I that's a good way to put it and you mentioned your first novel. Can you just like give us a little summary of that, what that's about, your writing process for that? Yeah, that's called Life in a Lion's Mouth. That was a little easier book to write. Um, 
the new one, Confessions, was really hard to write because it was, it's really hard to write somebody falling in love. And I had to do it like five times in that book. You know, it's really not easy because mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't translate. It's lost in translation and all that. Um, so the first book was easier because it just each scene led to the next one. And it still took me as long because it was my first book. But um, that's a book just about it. It's a coming of age book. It's called Life in a Lion's Mouth. And it's a boy who's, when he's five years old, his dad takes him to the circus. And his dad says, they see a man put his head in a lion's mouth. And the father says, I, that's what I want for you, for your life. I want you to live life in a lion's mouth. And then the father dies the next day. So that's the last thing ringing in his ears. Um, so he turns into a very awkward boy. And um, he takes his dad's advice literally. He joins a circus and puts his head in a lion's mouth. And then he meets a girl um, named Dana. And they, she's a folk singer. This is set in 1962. And they run off to Greenwich Village for the folk movement festival then, you know, the, the movement. You know, Bob Dylan and Peter Paul and Mary and all those things. Um, so then he has this little kind of romance there. And that, that story's a lot more true to life and um, a little bittersweet, you know. This one, I was just trying to be entertained, as entertaining as I possibly could. Well, I think you succeeded. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um, and do you have any plans for any like future books or projects in general? Yeah, um, so I just started uh, a new book. And it's set in Alaska, where I went to college. Um, it alternates chapters, one's in 1990s, which is when I was up there. And it's um, kind of goes around the, the theater world. There's a really cool, I went to Juno, and there's a really cool artistic community up there. Um, and it's like I would be, I'd hand out a short story in my creative writing class, and then I might be on the bus, and somebody I didn't even know would come up to me and say, yeah, I read your short story about so-and-so, oh, this is really cool. And it's like, because it was like an underground type of artistic community. So I want to try and get that across in the 1990s version. And then it alternates chapters with 1890, the Soapy Smith story. Soapy Smith was a gangster, um, an outlaw, who took over Skagway, Alaska. And a lot of the things you hear, like the word mark and cons, those are all things that came from him. You know, he was like a ruthless, horrible person. So in that one, my character um, comes to town and um, there's always a convention in like gangster or outlaw movies where um, the person comes to town, they, got, they show a remarkable skill, and the person who's running the town in a nefarious way kind of thinks, well, maybe I can use this skill. So they approach the person and kind of try and recruit them. So in this case, um, the person's, my character's remarkable skill is that he understands Plato's the allegory of the cave. So that's um, what draws Sophie Smith to him, because he was an intellectual, even though he was kind of a scummy type guy. But when he was younger, he was from a very affluent family, and he studied Shakespeare and all this stuff. So uh, my character becomes valuable to him because he's an intellectual that's transplanted in you know, this, this story. Cool. And then the two stories kind of start um, affecting each other. Mm -hmm. And then it has a twist at the end that's um, pretty cool, I think. I'm excited to read it. I, honestly, I love those stories. And it's like, you think it's two separate plot lines, and it's like, oh, wait, it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I think that was all that I had. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add, if just anything that you didn't get to say that you wanted to. Uh, can't really think of anything. That, that went quick. Gabby? Good. Um, basically, why would you tell somebody to check out the book? You know, I think the book appeals, Confessions of a Farmer's Market, Romeo, appeals to um, all genders because it's a fast-moving story. It's almost like a sitcom. Um, it's set in Gettysburg. And if you're from Gettysburg or, you know, most people from around here visit Gettysburg, you would, you would recognize a lot of the, the landmarks. And it's just a fun little story that takes place there. And it's a um, fast-moving, whimsical story that you can read, you know, pretty quickly. You know, you, sometimes you have the same customers for years and years, and you, they become part of your life, and you become part of theirs. 
and you get these wonderful chances to administer to them or them to you. Um, I had one, one time I was on a square in Gettysburg and a woman came by our stand and I said, how are how, how you doing? Never seen her before. And she goes, well, I'm, I'm dying. I'm going up here, I'm walking up to the lawyer to um, make, the, make the preparations because I don't have anybody else, wow. right? So it's like, luckily my daughter was with me at the stand that day. So I let her watch the um, stand yeah. and I was able to, to talk to the woman for like 20 minutes, yeah. um, you know, and I really wish, looking back, I really wish I had walked to the lawyer with her because nobody should walk to the lawyer to make their final preparations by themselves. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not like I totally whiffed. I did, you know, talk to her for 20 minutes and sure try to minister that. to her. Yeah. yeah. And then we have, you know, other things where um, people literally cry on your shoulders. And um, it is, farmers markets are part of the community because, um, you know, you got people that, that might be their highlight of the week. Coming to, that's what they're looking forward to all week, to come to the farmer's market, just relax and buy from five or six vendors or whatever and have their conversations. And you do get, especially I hit this in Gettysburg where people walk there, um, much older people and, you know, they would come to the market and you might be the only person they talk to that week in any meaningful way. Yeah. You know, so, you know, there is all that <coughs> reward, but none of that sort of the story. I mean, that, that's not the tone of the story. Yeah. So I couldn't put any of that good stuff in 